Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for ChartsAndMarkets.com. Welcome to our Christmas edition of the show, Bob. Oh, do I hear the sound of Christmas music in the background? Uh, no, those are uh, Santa's reindeer just warming up. Right, okay. Yeah, well, for, for the big trip. Always an enjoyable time of year. I I enjoy Christmas. I do indeed. And it's uh, a celebration also for the turn of the year. And that goes back for thousands of years. I looked it up the other day. And, uh, yeah, society has recognized the turn of the year. Uh, more or less near the turn of the year, and there's always been festivities, and why not? Let's enjoy it as best we can with the uh, the threats to health these days. So uh, here we are uh, in the early part of the turn of the year. We have uh, one question to start off the show. It's from our longtime listener. I call him Cecil. You call him Cecil. I think if he's a Brit, it would be Cecil, and I hope that Cecil, Cecil, one time sends us a note saying uh, what pronunciation he prefers. Maybe he likes both. Yeah. Cecil, Cecil, I don't care what you call me, just yeah. as long as you spell my name right on the check. Yes. From Cecil, Cecil, Merry Christmas, Jim and Bob. Thanks for a great year and hope you have a great 2022. The question for Bob... What was the most unexpected or surprising story of 2021, whether that's something that happened or didn't happen, and what do you think will be the most unexpected stories of 2022? Ooh, good question. Uh, yeah, uh, the year worked out very well for us, because in Ju January we thought, hey, things are shaping up here, we can uh, have a uh, a, a good run for most things right through until around mid-year, which was a natural target. That would mean commodities up, credit spreads narrowing, stock market uh, being positive, and it did. And then we thought that uh, August could be a transition. Uh, well, the first part would be sunshine, and then the next August would be twilight, and there was a little twilight. And then in the fall, there was the probability of going into a more serious credit contraction, which we called the Twilight Zone, and uh, which would probably influence New York and London by some time in the fall. That's a classic. It's happened before. So this then, uh, in March, you started with announcements from South Africa, Argentina, and Turkey that their central banks had suddenly run out of liquidity. U.S. dollar went up with that, but that's okay. And then it continued. Now, all of the times we spent talking about China and Evergrande and some of these other property developers that are in deep trouble, this was the credit crisis that can follow a great financial boom and these usually appear uh, early in the year that the financial markets go crazy and uh, I always used to use the term lesser markets <laughs> but with China it's not a lesser market so let's call it an outlying exchange well China is in the, the world is in a credit contraction that did not severely hit the U.S. 
Um, this seemed to happen as all of a sudden in, well, we were looking for a high in crude oil late September, early October, that sort of seasonality did. But then all of a sudden, boom, they were bidding up aluminum and vanadium and cobalt and and then inflation is going to run to the moon. Uh, it's the 1970s inflation back again. But what it turned out to be is a rotation. Natural gas, they, these things went straight up. And only a very few are going still up. So this excitement and the ability to bid up some commodities and particularly keep crude oil up was very helpful for the U.S. stock markets. And... Uh, we had the change in credit spreads were likely to narrow into about mid-year, and they did. And then they turned and they set a trend for widening, but nothing became dramatic because all of a sudden there was speculative zest came out of everywhere and everything turned into a party. So, Cecil, the surprise is not the credit crisis that's going on out there. The surprise is not that we've had a fabulous stock bubble. The surprise is that the rest of the world is in a credit contraction and they've been able to keep New York partying. And it's as simple as that. So uh, also you can have uh, seasonally uh, right into January uh, – is a, often a seasonal period where stock markets can be positive. So we'll just see how far this goes. But I, my view is that <clears throat> the greatest financial bubble, <clears throat> excuse me, in history has been accomplished. The uh, there were extraordinary things with it, uh, like for example, the German ten-year note in nominal terms, got to a negative yield. In the whole history of interest rates, you've never had that happen. And then also, in the history of the stock side, you've had cryptos and bitcoins, which are large cap things, and uh, making percentage gains like you can't believe, whereas, say, the South Sea Bubble, the big deal company, uh, it made a, a gain of 10 times in a year. Whereas these uh, cryptos are huge compared to that, so there's no question that the big action is in the is in financial assets, and historically, all five of the previous great financial bubbles, once they were over, asset prices head south. Uh, it's the way it works. Where the street that has not studied financial history enough is saying that all of a sudden with a Marxist government in the United States and the central bank that's just as reckless as it's ever been, that this would turn into 1970s type of inflation. And we have had some good runs. But if you take the CRB, <clears throat> it's uh, it's the most of overbought since the, the peaks in 2011 and 2008. And uh, so that was the best they could do with inflation then. And uh, inflation and commodities now, then, hey, that's done it. It's it's the best. And there's, as I said a little while ago, Jim, there's very few of them still at uh, making new highs. So, but oddball things like cobalt and lithium and stuff like that. So the we think the danger is that the speculation has been in financial assets and we'll just run through those in a typical bubble the last the final phase of it has real long interest rates going down they have they're down to about minus six percent now you have copper's real price going up and we have had that you've had gold's real price going down in financial bubbles, believe it or not, gold's real price goes down. But over the last number of months, it seems like it's trying to base. And another item in, that's a feature of the conclusion of a great bubble is that the gold-silver ratio goes down. It goes down in, in any, any party. 
and it's now set an uptrend. The other one is that in the post-party, the post-bubble contraction, the senior currency, which is U.S. dollar, it trends up against other currencies, and it has been. So I can sit here and say that base metals, precious metals, real interest rates, and all this sort of stuff are doing what they usually do at the end of a great mania, and then as they change, that will suggest that the mania is turning into a post-bubble contraction, and the change would be the next leg up in the U.S. dollar, uh, accompanied by a rising gold-silver ratio, accompanied by the gold, real price of gold going up, and then also uh, the real price of copper going down. So these we've accomplished what's needed for the end of a bubble. What is ahead is as these uh, important items change. So we're watching closely for them, Jim. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Bob, you alluded to this uh, while answering your the question from Cecil slash Cecil, and that's uh, liquidity threat looming over the markets in the new year is perhaps uh, something we should keep an eye on. So what's the story there? Oh, yeah. This is the fascinating thing about a highly speculative market. Is people know the outstanding debt, uh, New York Stock Exchange market uh, leverage debt is, is way up there, and it's had quite a sharp spike up. So this then is borrowed money bidding up stocks or bonds, and that gives the appearance of liquidity. But it's not real money, it's leverage money. So this is this happens at the end of every great speculative market. There seems to be any number of bids. And then all of a sudden, but those bids are only there so long as the price goes up. And as an old saying I recall from the Vancouver Stock Exchange, is that so long as the price of the stock is going up, the public will leave the most preposterous story. And then once it stops, boom, it changes. So then oftentimes, and this is part of the leverage game, Jim, is that the, some professional traders can get short a little early and then comes in a wave of, of speculative buying and then they're forced to cover. It's called a short squeeze. So when, at least when the stock market's got a good short position on it and it goes down, there are bids there that will eventually be uh, invoked as such that you, there are buys on the way down but when you squeeze all the shorts out of the top those bids are gone so what appears to be immense liquidity is is just plain old leverage and when the prices break and that's it's what it's all about it as simple as that then the uh, margin clerks take over and uh, then you get into the contraction so we had this has been the greatest financial bubble in history. It's done what it usually does, and it's now vulnerable. But it's very difficult to catch when it rolls. So we've got a number of benchmarks that we're watching here in credit spreads, in commodity prices, and in some of the leading stock groups to watch for, let's call it a line in the sand. If this thing sort of happens, then we start to prepare for uh, the reversal to eventually there will be a bear market. You can't say exactly when until it's underway, but the uh, the action certainly has been wild. Also, uh, we have a high debt burden facing uh, a lot of uh, people, governments especially, 
And corporations this time around, Bob, with the ones that made some of them record profits, instead of saving that money for perhaps a downturn in the markets or the economy next year, they've decided to buy back their shares. Are these buybacks a bad idea? Shouldn't they just hold on to that cash oh, or yeah, give it no. to their shareholders? That's a game that started in a dull market with, with the corporate funds. And uh, so... Um, the boards of directors and senior executives at many companies uh, became stock market operators rather than corporate executives. And uh, so they then, uh, much of their uh, returns and bonuses are based upon stock options and stock prices. So let's get it going. So they found that they could borrow money cheaply and buy the stock, which they thought cheaply, and the the really terrible example is Boeing's, where they spent some forty five billion dollars on stock buybacks, and then scrimped on the engineering on developing the new uh, that new uh, airplane. Um, people killed. It. You know this is terrible. So the it, it is because the bull market has gone on for so long that too many senior executives and directors have become stock market operators. Uh, rather than sound corporate executives. And this is also even worse lately because I've read that the amount of insider selling at these companies is increasing. So uh, the key insiders are selling stocks, having put in uh, extraordinary bids through the stock buybacks. This is... This is, Jim, it is bad business and it stinks. Uh, financial markets should be free. Financial markets should have minimal regulation. And there's always, uh, shareholders can take with fraud charges and stuff like that. But some of these games are really bad and, uh, I, you can't get them to quit because the game has been successful. And it will be successful until the whole thing fails. And, of course, at some time it will fail. And the company's balance sheets are going to be really bad because they will have been borrowing money. <laughs> and then interest rates at the long end can go up as uh, in a post-bubble contraction because uh, the problem is with debt service, corporate debt service. And then the other one is that uh, all that debt will be on the balance sheet, and the earnings are going to be heading south. So, you know, it it's all part of the madness, Jim. And uh, one can describe it, one can condemn it, but unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it until afterwards. And then uh, uh, governments will get very busy on uh, slamming the bond door after the horse is bolted. So, oh, they'll go crazy uh, in a fit of, uh, what word should we use? I don't know, uh, just trying to prevent something that they should have tried to prevent earlier. So, But you've had this before. A- after a financial bubble, there's always recriminations and second-guessing and all sorts of things, but you have to wait until it, until it ends and uh, there was a probability that the U.S. could get hit this fall due to a building credit crisis around the world the credit crisis around the world it continues to become a problem and at some point the speculative furies in New York will end and uh, we'll, we'll be watching for it but my god in the meantime it's fascinating uh, also, with the buybacks, Bob, I predict this. If there's a crash, all these companies that bought back their shares with their multi-millions of dollars in profits will go whining to the government asking for a taxpayer handout. Oh, yeah. Boeing already has. Yeah. 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 No, and then you had the problems in the Obama administration with General Motors and... uh all kinds of perks and protectionism and everything else, and then the global car business became competitive. And uh, but then Obama went and bailed them out, bailed out the unions, bailed out everything. Where t- typically, when a company goes wrong, it has good. Some companies have good assets, 
And all what, what a default does is hopefully gets the assets into competent hands. Whereas this thing, Obama uh, bailed them all out, and it stayed in incompetent hands. So this is where business recessions are very good things. Is they keep uh, management and investors on their toes, and the more that governments try to prevent recessions, the wilder the financial markets become. And uh, they're wild now. You've got absolutely reckless central banking going on, you have reckless uh, investments going on. Uh, pension funds have been forced to buy junk because they can't get a decent return on investment-grade stuff. And the reason why you can't get a decent return on investment-grade stuff is because the Fed has been buying bonds out of the market and interest rates are artificially low. So it's you can have bubbles with without intrusive government, and they've happened in the past. But when you've got a bubble with intrusive governments, it's going to be interesting. And also, if you look in your own country, uh, politics, you most ordinary people say these guys have gone absolutely mad. They want to control you through COVID. They want to control you through weather threats. So the political side of the world is on a bubble mania as well, and they've been then inflating credit, depreciating currency to finance their mania, and of course then what happens then is the stock markets get even wilder. So my guess, Jim, is that when the wild speculation in the financial markets ends, it'll bring down the wild speculation in the political markets. Uh, it's going in, to be interesting. In Canada, we have the goods and services tax, the GST, the federal government collects on virtually everything. And so if the prices of things go up, if inflation's running rampant, the federal government actually makes more money. Why would they want to control inflation if you look at that? Could that be one of the reasons why they do very little to control it? They uh, depreciate the currency on purpose because... Typically, in, when governments go uh, unlimited, uh, the uh, ambition goes out, is, is becomes incredible. So they fund their activities through taxation. And they push taxation to the painful point, and then they can't push it anymore. Then the next step is you de- they depreciate the coinage. And this was this is what brought the Roman Empire to an end. Uh, it brought the the fifteen hundreds was a period of rampant depreciation and inflation, and eventually it burned out, and there was a great reformation. So, no, this is typical of uh, uh, I've called them tyrannical centuries, uh, tyrannical century where. The government's become tyrannical, and the dentry is because they're just plain stupid. But they do it, and they do it until they ruin the economy. So uh, we're in a very exciting time. This is similar to the end of the crazy part of the Roman Empire, which blew itself out in the early 300s, and is similar to the end of the tyrannical century of the 1500s, the early 1600s, quite similar to this, and uh, where they just go crazy. And then it crashes. And as I say, (laughs) sometime, who knows, maybe next year, the, uh, the degree of speculation just becomes unsupportable and the whole thing starts to contract. And once it starts, it will be irresistible. Bob, thank you so much for chatting with us, and I'm looking forward to our New Year's Eve show. We will be there for you, Jim, and uh, in the meantime, let's just call it a Santa Claus rally, and oftentimes there are positive moves in the stock market from December into January, and we seem to be on one, so we'll just watch and see where it goes. So, Looking forward to talking to you next week. It's a sugar high from all those chocolates. (laughs) Yeah. 
My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. If you have any questions for Bob, he loves to answer them. Send them to info at howstreet.com, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Merry Christmas. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.